Hello and welcome to Watch Talk Radio. My name is Brian Matora and usually with me as always is Brock Wiggum, but Brock is not here today, but I do have a special guest. It's Matthew Purvis. Matthew, how are you doing today? Hi, Brian. Yes, I'm doing well and uh, looking forward to this interrogation. <laughs> yeah, the interrogation. Good. <laughs> Let me start the interrogation, get the bright light on you. So, Matthew, you were a Jehovah's Witness, correct? Yeah. Were you born into the religion or did you convert to it at a later age? No, um, like many, I was born into Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, my parents, um, my mother and father were also born into it practically. Um, and on my father's side, it goes back to his grandparents. So I think that works out as me being fourth generation, something like that. Oh, wow. So you guys have been, your family has been in there for quite some time. Yes, that's right. Um, I know they were very, very uh, staunch Bible students. Um, my father tells me my great grandparents didn't really have much time for their children because they were so busy out in the ministry. And that, of course, was the early days when Russell was uh, running things. Um, and they would class themselves as anointed. I don't know if you've come across that, presumably that. Sure. Where they're the members of the um, the uh, heavenly class. Yeah, so it goes back a long way. Wow, so your family goes all the way back to Russell. When did you, when did you embrace the faith as your own? At what point did that happen? Yeah, that's a very good question because um, I don't know whether I really woke up to being a Jehovah's Witness until... I was in my mid-teens. Um, I just seem to remember one day thinking, oh, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I, um, as a child, I was distracted by other things. Um, and then suddenly it dawned on me. Um, and I took it rather seriously. Certainly when I turned age 16, which generally is about the age that uh, children or teenagers as witnesses um usually decide to uh, think about baptism. And sure enough, that's what I did. I got baptized then. And after you got baptized, were you wholeheartedly in the faith, going door to door and doing all the things that the Watchtower Society requires of you? Yes, I would definitely say that. Um, I have to uh, admit that it was rather a uh, drudgery at times having to um, go out in ministry and also, you know, coming across people you knew at school or college, that was always um, a source of great embarrassment to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I did it and I have to admit that my background is quite strict in terms of the witness community um, from a good background, but nonetheless, with my father being an elder, it was kind of expected of me that I would take it seriously and, uh, yeah, just be, I think the, the word is exemplary. They call about, certain witness youths are termed exemplary. So I suppose I would be trotted out as a, an exemplary publisher, exemplary witness, young witness, um, and that's what I tried to be. Was that a lot of pressure for you? Because here you are, you're a fourth generation Jehovah's Witness going all the way back to the times of Russell. Your family's very established within the faith itself. And then your father's an elder. And here you come along. And was that a lot of pressure for you? Did you feel the pressure? Um, yes. I mean, I uh, found the pressure um, most evident at school um, and also defending my faith, which I found difficult at times. And also my goals, I think, were aims were to get an education and that went as far as going to college, but no further. So there was no higher education. That really wasn't possible. Um, and yeah, that was unfortunate. I wanted to uh, to pursue an academic uh, future, but I couldn't. However, I thought, well, if I can't throw my lot in there, I'll throw it in with the Watchtown Society. And that's when I had the idea of going on into what they call the Pioneer Service and then hopefully down into uh, Bethel, which is their headquarters. 
So despite the fact that you didn't like going door to door all that much, you ended up being a pioneer? I did. Yes, I did that for about four years. I mean, it wasn't so bad. Um, yeah, I, I can't say that it was uh, my raison d'etre by any means. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it was um, it was a it was kind of expected of me, I think. Uh, when I look back, why did I make that decision? Um, there are those external pressures as well. And maybe I saw it as a route towards uh, f- further furthering my work in the organization. So it was a means to an end to some extent. Yeah, kind of furthering your watchtower career. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I want to get to that in just a minute. But before I do... Um, I want to ask you a question because a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses complain when I make videos or I talk about how the Watchtower Society mm. doesn't want you really to pursue higher education. And I, of course, pull out Watchtower quotes to back up that claim, but they will often tell me, no, no, that's not right. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses are fine with somebody pursuing higher education as long as you're making, you know, the the kingdom publishing work, you know, a priority in your life. What, what how would you answer that? Well, um, I mean, that is utter rot. <laughs> I don't know where they get that from. It's bunkum. It really is. I mean, you know, they must be lying to themselves to come up with that because um I have to admit, there was a, a season, and it only lasted um, maybe five, ten years, something like that, the most, where there was a um, a certain um, uh, latitude about pursuing higher ed- education. Um, but before then, um, there was absolutely no way I, I would go, and it would have, it would have. Um, it, it, would, it wouldn't have been good on my father in terms of his eldership. And I even, I even know somebody at Bethel who went. Um, he tells me he went to university uh, and his father was removed as an elder. Uh, and then after that sort of lax period, which didn't last too long now, I mean, it's really con- um, condemned. I mean, it's it, it's um, uh, it's. It opens up questions regarding a person's position in the watchtower. If, for example, a father is allowing his son to go to university, there is a strong possibility that the elders review, the, his fellow elders review his qualifications as to whether he should remain an elder. So I really don't understand where they get that from. Yeah, I don't understand it either. It seems from mm-hmm. any common sense reading of the watchtower that you, you can't come to the position that they're arguing for. So when you decided to pursue your watchtower career, as it was, and you, you started to pioneer, did you end up in Bethel in London? Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah, so I pioneered for four years and applied for Bethel, I think, three times maybe? Yeah, on three occasions. And on the, the third occasion, I was accepted. Back then, the Bethel family was only small. It must have been around about 200, 250. Um, and then when I left, it was about ooh, 550. So there was a lot of expansion going on when I went. Um, and I was delighted to to, uh, to receive the call. <laughs> um, but it's when I got there that it proved rather disappointing. Mm. So here you are. You you wanted to get to Bethel. You had that as a goal. You made it to Bethel. I can only imagine that your family must have been extremely proud to have a son at Bethel. And yeah. to- yes, yes, I'm, I'm glad to get rid of me. I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> most parents are. But yeah, no, it, it was uh, it, it was a source of pride. Yeah, and the congregation threw a big party for me as well, a, a go away party. So then, what yeah. happened once you got there? Well, um, listen, the first the first week I was there, I just detected that um, it was something of a playground. You know, there was a lots of young lads. Uh, I mean, I was probably about 20 then. Um, they were younger lads, maybe age 19, 18. No, probably no, sorry, age 19. Um, and in that mix, there were degrees of what I call spirituality. Of course, now I would say there, was, there wasn't any, but what I mean is the Christian character that you expect to find 
I didn't. Um, and that was a source of disappointment. Uh, yeah, it just seemed like um, it was rather akin to a public school. You know, we have public schools over here and they're up to all sorts. Um, and as long as the head teachers don't find out, then uh, they get away with it. So, yeah, I, I just did not like the atmosphere. I've heard that from former Bethelites in the United States, too, that they went to Bethel thinking that they were going into some sort of spiritual paradise. Mm, yes. And yes. when they got there, they were greatly disappointed because it seemed that the people in Bethel were more worldly than the people even in their congregation. So that is that what you experienced there? Yes, yes, definitely. And the the booklet that you're given when you arrive even says, um, look, if you're not given to drinking, there's no need to start. <laughs> a kind of a warning um, that you may come across this. And certainly I did. There's a lot of alcohol consumed there, um, a lot of partying. Um, and I can understand why it happens. It's like rather like a pressure cooker. And, you know, that release valve is maybe just to... Uh, go on a bender at the weekend. Oh, wow. So what was your job when you were at Bethel? Well, I had several. I started out in uh, security for a brief spell. Then they put me in the electrical department. And I was there pretty much all the time uh, working um, in the stores. They had a large um, electrical storeroom. And also in refrigeration, latterly I was doing, I was involved in the refrigerate, refrigeration, uh, fixing, engineering, that stuff. And then um, in between that, I had other duties like airport runs and I was a tour guide, uh, a receptionist. So, uh, yeah, I, I got to see a lot of Bethel. So at what point did you start doubting or what was it that caused you to start doubting? Yes. When I think back, it would have to be, firstly, by their fruits, you shall know them. So you're expecting that kind of fruit and it isn't there. Um, also, the regime's quite oppressive. I used to, um, to get to get to kind of release the pressure. I used to watch, I don't know if you know, uh, the old 60s series, The Prisoner with Patrick McGowan. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's a cult TV series from the 1960s, and it's about him being trapped in the village and how he tries to make escape. And I used to watch this program and think there are some parallels to this and Bethel, really, the way it's run, um, the way you kind of a prisoner to uh, this oppressive environment. Um, it is a regime. And increasingly, I was getting... Uh, depressed, anxious. It was, uh, it wasn't very good for my emotional health. So I just felt that if this is supposed to be Christ's kindly yoke, then he can keep it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but of course I, I realized that there was something rotten in the state of Denmark. Right. Something <laughs> rotten in the state of Denmark. Yeah. That's right. Mm. So you started looking around and started seeing what was going on around you and thought to yourself, okay, if we know them by their fruits, there yes. seems to be a problem here. What did you do at that point? Because you had to have a lot tied up in your identity as a Jehovah's Witness. Your family's proud of you. You're kind of reaching the uh, a pretty high goal when it comes yes. to the Jehovah's Witness religion. You know, being a Bethelite is a, is a big deal. That must have really caused you some torment. What What did you do next? Well, um, by this time, I was an elder in, uh, in, in Bethel, and I was very busy in a Chinese congregation, um, uh, which was rewarding. Certainly, you get to see a lot of life outside of Bethel as a result of being in a foreign language congregation. There's a different atmosphere as well. It's, I would say foreign language congregations initially are quite liberal. Um, they're sort of a bit more open. So I, I managed to find a home there for a while. But towards the end of Bethel was the time that the Internet became 
um, fashionable. And uh, although I couldn't access it freely at Bethel, what I did was I used to sneak out of my flat, go down to an internet cafe and started looking, started searching websites that had information about the Watchtower, because in the past, as a as a as a teenager, I had been into Christian bookshops, and frankly, the books, the so-called apostate books I'd come across, were pretty inadequate. Uh, they didn't really deal with the the nuts and bolts of the organisation. So, getting on the net was a real eye opener and broadened my horizons as to how Bethel functions, the the characters that run it, um, and um, particularly for me, I was focused on doctrine. I realised that we could, I could get, and I could end up being caught up in uh, character assassination. I wasn't really interested in personality so much as as the truth, as discovering just really what is the truth, because this organisation does not feel like the truth to me. So, what year was it that you that this all started to happen for you? What? Oh, I. So th- this would be about 2002. Okay. Um, yeah, so sneaking out a bit then. And then what happened is my mother fell ill. She wasn't too well. Um, and because other family members couldn't care for her, I had to return home to Manchester. And <clears throat> really, I was glad of that. I was glad to get out. And I had there, then a legitimate reason to leave if you leave Bethel for any other reason than maybe sickness or uh, marriage or maybe pregnancy, and I certainly wasn't pregnant, <laughs> then, <laughs> then um, it's looked down on. So uh, I had this great reason to leave, and yeah, I, I took it with both hands. Yeah. Yeah. So you wanted you wanted to get out of there because you knew it wasn't a healthy place for you. So you yeah. go home to take care of your sick mother, and yes. what and what happens next? Well, yes, um, that's when I had access to the the web uh, all the time. Um, I was with her during the day and, you know, I could uh, surf to my heart's content and I could read my Bible and check out the doctrines and just um, compare them with scripture. And that's what I did. I sifted through all of that. I didn't uh, look at... Um, like Raymond Franz's uh, literature or anything like that. I uh, I really wanted to discover my, for myself. Uh, yeah, so that's basically what I did. Comparing translations, reading the Bible. Prayer, of course, was a big thing. Um, and I just hit a point where the New Testament spoke to me that this text is not for a limited number it's clearly for everyone who who exercise who exercises faith you know it's not just for 144,000 as the watchtower claims it has to be for for everyone uh you know and i realized then that a lot of these phrases you come across in scripture like being reconciled being justified uh redeemed and so on didn't apply to me uh, and the more I looked into the Watchtower doctrine, uh, the more I realized this gulf between me and God and that the only thing really that was that gave me any kind of uh, uh, legitimacy in, in my Christianity was the Watchtower Society being almost a mediator, a link between me and God. And that didn't feel right at all because of course, the you know First Timothy two says there's only one mediator, that the man Christ. Yeah, and and the Watchtower does teach that, and they've really been reasserting that in their magazines, at least in the last few months, very heavily that that they are the anointed class, and that and that mm-hmm. your salvation comes depending on your loyalty to these anointed ones and what you do. And they they refer to it as what clinging to the skirt of the Jew, 
That's how mm. that's how you get saved, and that's actually in the latest Watchtower, the, the April fifteenth edition that just came out. There's a story about that, and about how this man realized that his salvation was dependent upon his loyalty to the organization. So they do set themselves up as a mediator between God and man. But it sounds to me like you decided to kind of put the Watchtower stuff on the shelf for a little while, and in maybe let go of the influence of the magazine and let the scripture start speaking to you. Yes, that's right. I remember out in the ministry with somebody and I said to them, I'm just reading my Bible at the moment. I'm enjoying it. I've just decided to read it without any uh, any preconceptions. And they looked worriedly at me and said, well, you know, you need the watchtower to explain things. Um, it's strange, isn't it, how something as innocuous as Bible reading, just simply picking up the word of God and reading it, even that is uh, is considered dangerous somehow if it's outside the confines of the Watchtower world. Do you think it's that way because it's taught and implied so much and reinforced so much at the kingdom halls, or is it just something in the culture of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Or Because I do find that. I find a Watchtower apologist saying, no, we just believe what's in the Bible. We we can read the Bible. We read the Bible all the time. But when I talk to ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and current Jehovah's Witnesses who are still loyal to the organization, most of them do seem to have that fear of reading the Bible alone. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Well, they would class that as independent thinking. You know, they'll give you a label uh, like you're out of step with God's organization. Um, yeah, th- this sort of stuff. So people are afraid to admit and not just admission to actually uh, go ahead and, and do things which the Watchtower prohibits. That's what it is. They do prohibit. It is a prohibitive culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you with what you're saying. I do view it, you know, as an outsider, as somebody who is never a Jehovah's Witness, but who is who has researched them in depth for almost a decade now, that they seem to be a very prohibitive culture and a very controlling culture when it comes to information, what you can read, what you can't read. I mean, when the Bible itself becomes something that's taboo to read and think about, you know, that seems to me it would be a a giant red flag, especially Mm. in light of what Timothy says. You know, the scriptures are sufficient for teaching and rebuking and training and righteousness. It seems to me almost impossible to take the view that the word of God could be dangerous, but so you know, so many Jehovah's Witnesses do, and I wonder how they get to that place. Yeah, well, as you say, it's steeped in the culture. It's taught that way. Um, you, I used to say to a friend, when you walk into a kingdom hall, you leave your brain at the, at the lobby, you know, at the front door. That's what <laughs> happens. You just go in, and uh, there you are, a brainstem absorbing whatever they say. Uh, There's no critical thinking. I was just reminded as well of a time when I was pioneering out with somebody in the service. And I recall this woman was a fairly sort of liberal, outspoken witness. Um, And yet we were at a door and we left some literature and they gave me uh, a book about Christ. It was nice. I was looking forward to reading it and she snatched it from me. And as we walked to the next door, there was a a, a, a sort of wheelie bin. She took the lid off and just threw it in. That you know, with (laughs) you know, callous. Um, And that that is it. There's a fear. There's an implanting fear that uh, that somehow you're going to be infected. Right. Almost a contempt for anything that's not written. Yeah, by the watchtower so. about God. It's always a fun little game to play with a Jehovah's Witness at the door when they want to hand you a watchtower magazine and you try to hand them a tract. Mm. And, you know, some will take it but and probably throw it away, you know, just so you'll take the magazine. But others won't touch it. You know, I've had them actually put up their hands and be like, whoa, no, I'm, I can't take that. <laughs> it's <laughs> no. like, but you want me to take your magazine, but. My literature, you're going to say, oh, I can't take that. I can't read that. How is that right? Do you want me to have an open mind, you know, when it comes to the to the magazine that you're handing me or should I prejudge it? 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's double standard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. A, it is a double standard. So mm-hmm. here you are. You you start to read the Bible. You start to see words like redemption and grace and and mm-hmm. all these other words and and how there's only one mediator between God and man. Yet you still have family in the watchtower. You still have culture. You know, the, all your friends in the watchtower. I don't know. Are you married at this point? No, I wasn't married by then. No, uh, that was just a few few years later. Okay, so so what happened next? Right, so um, life was getting busier and busier, and I was getting tired and wrung out and burned out, and I saw an opportunity to uh, leave behind all the responsibility I had and come off from being an elder, which I did, um, and just said, look, I'm, I'm not well, and people accepted that. But of course, what re- was really happening behind the scenes was I had I had done all this research and um, I just was dissatisfied. So I came off from serving as an elder and uh, was continuing to research on the web, re- reading scripture. And then finally, I, I was out at work um, one summers in uh, 2007. And I just remember feeling completely distraught, uh, like there was just no point in going on. And I stopped, walked down a side street, and I just remember sitting down on the wall and praying to God in a way that I had never done before. Um, just saying, look, do with me what you will. I know that you're in charge. It was very much... Um, um, a cathartic moment, but also one of giving myself to God and just saying, you're in charge now. Um, you know, I, I've, I've lost everything. Take me. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, that, that was, that was the, the thing. Now, at the same time, I don't know whether this was before, I can never get the time exactly right, but I'd also attended a memorial of the witnesses and it was clear to me that you should, partake of the emblems. So I'd also partake, taken of, of the emblems at home uh, privately. And it was kind of that combination of events that the the next day um, I was going out to work again, this time with my brother. And my word, I just I just couldn't believe the feeling I had inside myself of utter joy. Uh, how can I describe it? Um, well, it was this supernatural feeling that there was something new in me. Um, it's very difficult to convey this, but it felt as if God was living inside me. That's all I can say. Like Jesus and God were inside me. Almost, I prayed, al- sorry, go on. almost like you were born again. <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. yeah, absolutely. So, so that's it. I was praying about this and as soon as, soon as I prayed, um, the message came back to me quite clear. You're born again. And I, th- I thought this can't be true. So I asked God, can I, 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 you know, I'll open my Bible at random. And it fell to John, which, you know, I've done in the past. John 14, 23. Uh, I've got my Bible here. I'll just, where is this now? Uh, John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will observe my word and my father will love him. And we shall come to him and make our abode with him. Yes. And that's exactly what it felt like. It was, um, it, you know, Brian, it's very difficult to um, articulate this because it's a supernatural event. Uh, it's not something that um, is, uh, I don't know, rational almost. It's, it's, uh, it's out of this world. It's from God. It's Holy Spirit. But it's very real. And it transforms a person and the joy that you get as a result is overwhelming. I mean, everything made sense. I knew at that moment, all these verses came, came flooding to me that I'd been reconciled to God. You know, that I'd been justified, redeemed, declared righteous, that I'd passed over from death to life. It was a truly wonderful a feeling. And every time I prayed for, for reassurance, because I thought, is this is this just a, a delusion? You know, am I going out of my mind? As soon as I pray, the same joy would well up and confirmation from God that he was in me. 
So I, I then knew that that was it. I'd, 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 I was saved. <laughs> so now what yeah. you had was you had this living relationship with God as opposed mm. to just a, a duty filled yes. religion. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Before then, I mean, uh, what was I doing? I mean, I look back now and it was just all religious behavior and it was all head knowledge. Um, but what God wants is personal relationship. We can, we can know God as, as where, you know, as you, you and I are talking. That's how it can be. I hadn't realized that until that moment. And my goodness, I, and also I realized how dead I'd been. You know, I've been dead in my trespasses. Yes. And now this, this new life. Mm. It's amazing to me when I think of John 17, 3, in how the Jehovah's Witnesses don't really understand the difference in the two translations of that verse. This is eternal life, taking in knowledge of the only true God, right? The, the Jehovah's yeah. Witnesses interpretation and what you're explaining or what you yeah. just explained here. This is eternal life, knowing mm. the only true God. And uh, there's, there's such a distinction between those two because you can take in a lot of knowledge. I can take in a lot of knowledge about President Obama, but that's yeah. very different than knowing him. Yes. Yes. The way, precise. the way his children know him. And, and knowing him gives you access to him and it, and it gives you all sorts of information that, that I could never have. You know, being, being one of his children would, would give you all that. And what you're explaining is that knowing God as opposed to just taking in knowledge of God. And it's, it's such a beautiful thing that I wish Jehovah's Witnesses would think about and grab hold of and, and, and grasp mm -hmm. the reality of, of what it means to, to know God outside of a religion. Outside mm. of man-made doctrines and man-made principles, just knowing God. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it's very, it's very sad because they are victims of that Phariseeism that travels over land and sea to find one convert, you know, and make them twice as fit for destruction. Yes. They never get to, to have the real life, uh, the new birth. Yes. So you're born again now. And mm, yes, what happens? Yes. What happens within your family? What happens with your relationship with the watchtower? How do you how do you begin to reconcile this? Do you do you not tell anybody for a while or did you go public right away? Or what was your course of action? Yeah, I mean, th those those few years uh, from 2007 were a bit strange because there I was still going to the meetings um, thinking this is not the right place. Um, and also I was I, I was interested in theology, just trying to get a better understanding on evangelical theology, for example. And it seemed to me that the theology that I'd once had disdain for made a, a lot of sense to me. Uh, but also just Bible reading. Again, you have this new heart and once the spirit indwells, it guides you, as you know, into all the truth. So. Over that period, um, I started to question much of the major doctrines of the Watchtower, things like immortality of the soul, you know, post-mortem post existence and, uh, um, you know, their limited atonement for the, the 144,000. Um, and I also had a very good friend who I believe is born again. He's a witness. And we used to meet meet up together as well. Sadly, that relationship came to an end because um, he he was warned about me because people started to realise that I was becoming more and more uh, renegade, uh, different, however you might call it. Um, and then finally, last year, um, I just stopped going to the meetings because there, there was nothing there for me anymore. Oh, so it was just last year that well, you stopped. Let me just think. Oh, it would be sorry. It would be the year before. So it'd be two, two thousand and ten. Yeah, ten, middle of two thousand and ten. Sorry. Mm. Oh wow. So it's only been two years since you stopped going to the meetings. How did your yeah. family react, and how did your friends react to you? Well, I I told them about being born again, uh, my family, and initially they they think, oh, that's a bit strange. It's probably a phase, <laughs> and then. They start to think, well, maybe you've been called like like others have to be in the heavenly class in the 144,000. Uh, but it's quite clear. First John 5, 1 is classic. Everyone 
who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So it's not for a limited number. Um, and then I just started to make contact with other born again Christians who weren't necessarily churched, but were street preachers thereabout, you know, and I had conversations with them, made friends with some of them. And slowly I dawned on me that these are fellow Christians who are also in Christ as I am. And these are the people I need to be with. Um, and they share the same doctrine. Granted, I didn't know all the truth. Um, and I don't think Jesus does that. He can, he can save anybody anywhere and then slowly lead them into the truth. That's the way it goes. Yeah. It's that sanctification process where we, where we're, we're raised up by God and, and, and God brings us closer and closer to Him and closer and closer to truth as we go. As we live out our lives, and he does that by yeah. the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah. So um, uh, it, probably around about um, winter 2010, I went into a church uh, not too far from here. And, yeah, I settled in, got baptized, and basically I became, you know, a bog standard Christian. A normal Christian. <laughs> a normal. A, there's no such uh, thing as a normal Christian. No. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Let Let me ask you this. You don't have to tell what kind of church you go to or the name of your church or anything. I don't want you to do that. But is it pretty much just a, a mainline evangelical type of church? Well, the guy there is um, our minister. He is a street preacher. And, um, yeah, it's definitely mainline. He would he's called he calls it Stockport Wesleyan Church. It's called Wesleyan not because it's into, um, you know, sinless perfection or anything, more because it's evangelical, really. OK. Uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 I am aware of all the doctrines of the reformed view and Arminian and all that stuff. I mean, it really is quite uh, turgid, really. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you can go on forever with it, but um, I always say the first first thing is: Are you born of God? Have you had? Have you met God? Have you had an experience with God? Um, yeah, are you His child? You know, you know whether that's happened or not. And then I would encourage people to find a good, solid evangelical church. That practice, practices church discipline, that practices um, the essentials. Um, and of course, uh, you know, in Christianity, we're in Christ and yet there is room for debate on, you know, stuff like pre-tribulation raptures or whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, I encourage anybody to, well, to to look for the essentials first and foremost, that that's what we gather around. Uh, but I'm not into any kind of ecumenical stuff, you know. I, I wouldn't say try Catholics. <laughs> right. Standard uh, standard Protestantism. Saved by the <laughs> saved by the yeah. grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. The, uh, exactly, the gospel yes. first importance, right? Oh, wonderful. Yes, that that absolutely that sums me up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would warn anybody, even the Church of England, I'd, I'd warn people against because it brings people into uh, religious bondage. And, you know, I don't believe in baptismal regeneration. I, I believe that it can happen, uh, you know, before you're dunked. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I, I suppose if people were to pin me down, I think I've said, I don't know where to send a message to you. I probably am an evangelical. The problem is that I never use liking that term because it's sort of, it's allied with, uh, you know, people like John Hagee and stuff like that. You know, those people. Yeah, evangelical is a pretty slippery term because uh, Benny Hinn would consider himself an evangelical. Oh, uh, yeah, Benny Sin. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Benny Sin, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> not for me, no. No, not not for me either. So it really is kind of difficult to put the language on it. I, I continue to call myself non-denominational all the time because oh, I don't yeah. want to be bogged down with all the baggage of every other denomination. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. As well, as long as we're together in Christ, we, we, you know, this is the danger in First Corinthians one about saying I belong to Paul, Cephas, and so on. Uh, but it's Christ that died for us, and we need to find union in Him. 
Um, and my, not that it should be a test, but my question to anyone would be, have you been saved? Are you a child of God? Do you have the witness? Does the spirit bear witness with you that yours, that you are a child of God? Are you crying out, Abba, Father? All of those scriptures, you can't pretend. They, they have to have happened in some special way. If they have, that's great. You've been baptized into Christ. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. You, if you're born again, if, if you've received the spirit of God, you should know that you know that you know that mm, that absolutely. happened in your life. You know, God yes. is, is powerful and God is mighty. And when he comes into your life, he doesn't yeah. just breeze in, you know, like, like a, yeah. like a little gentle wind. You know, yeah. he comes into your life with power and he changes you. And I love the word that you used before about how he transformed your life. And even people around you saw that something was going on. Yeah. within your life and and you know that the light shines and you, you can't keep it hidden <laughs> no that's right yeah yeah um he gives you a whole new dimension of purpose to your life he really does i i have, I have a couple more questions one okay. is i know that a lot of jehovah's witnesses who have left the organization mm. and who have embraced jesus which we praise god for i know a lot yeah. of them have a hard time walking into a church and I um, think it's partially because the Watchtower has been so effective in demonizing other churches yeah. and what other churches do. Um, yeah. What was your experience? Why do you think it was so, I don't want to say it was easy for you, but you seem to be able to, to make the transition pretty smoothly into yeah. a church. What was it that led you there or allowed you to do that? Well, um, I was apprehensive too. I even drove to the church nearby and waited outside and was put off going in. I think it was around about the time of Christmas and I could see people walking with Christmas presents. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not going in there. But what happened is I was out in the town centre a week or two later and I got chatting to two guys, funny enough, as I came out of a shop who stopped me and they were from that church and they were they had a little small table and they were giving out um, bible tracts and yeah it was just that brief introduction letting them know who i was that i i was nervous about going and they said oh come on it's nothing to be nervous about um there are some people here who don't celebrate christmas that surprised me um you know um don't 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 feel you're under any pressure. Just come and sit and see what you think and you can leave whenever you want. So I did that. Um, and I was I was surprised. This church was clearly um, blessed by God, you know, the, 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 not just in the worship, but also in the teaching. I mean, the teaching was is phenomenal. I don't actually go to that church now. I go to a different one because I help out at a different one. But um, the, the the pastors there were terrific. There was a. You know, there's there's more than one elder, so that it wasn't um, a one man show. Um, you just felt like you were in the midst of the the body of Christ, and because the, there was only about forty or fifty there, many of them were clearly anointed, clearly, uh, yeah, bought by Christ's blood, proper, genuine, bona fide Christians. So um, I felt very comfortable. And uh, I, I look back and think, well, what was I afraid of? These these people aren't monsters. They're they're, they're very loving, very open. Yeah, I, I always try to tell ex Jehovah's Witnesses that we have to come to the reality that we don't serve a perfect church. There's no such thing as a spiritual mm. paradise. We serve a perfect Savior. Mm. Mm. And, you know, the church is filled with people who are born again, yet still struggle with sin, still yeah. make some bad choices at times. But... When you find a church, and if you take the time to, to experience a couple of different churches and go and look at the fruits of the churches, I think you're going to find out that the Watchtower hasn't been completely honest with you about what happens in these other churches. Would, would you agree with that? All right. OK. Yes, I was just saying that the churches that I attended, um, they've all been good churches. Fortunately, thank God. Um, maybe he's led me there. But in, the reality is that 
the 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 way that the witnesses are uh, portray churches is um is un, very unfair a lot of these places put the gospel at the center and they have outreaches they're involved in world mission they have uh teams of um ministers who go out into the streets and leaflets and preach and so on um they're very active in the community to get the word out there and and effectively you know not necessarily knocking at doors but many other other ways and they're vibrant and you can feel holy spirit there and receive it there so it's very very um disingenuous of the watchtower to to lump them all together as as evil christendom it just isn't the case yeah and that's exactly what they do they've created this boogeyman that they call mm-hmm. christendom and it's this big straw man argument where they lump everybody into one big huge group and say, well, look at how terrible Christendom is. Mm-hmm. And they never really go into detail about any particular church or any particular denomination. And they kind of wear that as a badge of honor saying, well, we don't pick on any particular church like you guys pick on the Jehovah's Witnesses. But in doing that, they're yeah. actually doing something worse because they're not really engaging the real issues they're just creating a boogeyman they're just creating a straw man and then they're beating down that straw man saying okay all churches are bad except for the jehovah's witnesses because of this christendom we've created Mm. Mm. absolutely right and um you know we have to remember as well that the the wonderful thing about church is that there is uh there's room for debate i mean you know, the scriptures aren't clear about everything. And so there's room for your conscience as well. It's not not that there's room for immorality, but that, um, you know, like in Romans 14, one man may choose to eat meat, the other vegetables. Uh, we know that whole passage is about uh, conscience and about, um, you know, differing opinion. But we don't have to be disagreeable about what we disagree over and that's what's so wonderful about uh, the true church is that um, we all if we're if we're good christians we look to christ jesus and we have unity in him and we we love one another because we see christ in in one another not because we see an organization not because of uniformity but it's it's all about jesus christ yeah, and I, I like what you say there because there is something about struggling over things that aren't clear in the scripture. I, I think that there's a real beauty in that when, when two Christian brothers or Christian brothers and sisters or whatever it may be can mm. come together and they kind of have a different view on what scripture is or, or what a particular doctrine means, one of these non-essential doctrines, and they really mm. dig into it and they struggle over it. I, I think that there's a beauty in that. And I think that God draws us closer to him in that struggle of doing that. And when you have a organization that's just telling you what scripture says, there's, there's yeah. no struggle on that. There's nothing that draws you closer to God. And in one man saying to you, this is what you're to believe about this. Take it or leave it. <laughs> you know, don't yes. go to the scriptures. Don't dig into it. Don't do this. Don't do any independent study. Just, just believe what we say. That's just conformity to to what a man says or what a particular group of men say. And I think the benefit of struggling with different doctrines and different teachings far outweighs any benefit that you can have from even a godly man just telling you what to believe. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I've been encouraged at church since then uh, um, to to keep learning for myself. The minister at our church um you know, we we were debating original sin just the the other day. We went for a coffee and we were talking about, you know, the, the different positions like the federal position and so on. Uh, I, I mean, I do find theology interesting, but um, nonetheless, we're trying to get to truth, but always looking at Christ, looking to Jesus. Um, and it's it's wonderful to be able to share, you know, that kind of conversation with somebody and being built up uh, in spirit, it's it's just fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, absolutely. In 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 a place where you're not being condemned because yes. you are thinking, or you're not being condemned because you're saying, "Hey, look, this is the word of God," 
And I want to I want to make an earnest effort to try to understand what he's saying to me through this book. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you if you had done that in the watchtower, um, you would be shut down. you would be taken to a back room. There'd be elders all over you. There might be a committee before you know it. You're being uh, in, you're in a star chamber being judged. Um, you're facing reproof crazy and it's interesting that you say that because if that same person switched the bible for a watchtower publication and dug in and just dug in and just read and spent tons and tons of time reading just the watchtower publication they would be commended for that Mm. so here you so here you have the word of god being the bad thing you know to really dig into and the watchtower literature being the good thing to dig into and people who are supposedly Christian people who are supposed to be upholders of truth and in elevating the word of God as the word of God are really in a large sense denying that the word of God has any power in the life mm. of the average believer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Brian, in reality, that that happens all the time. Having served as an elder for about six years, the best way forward to make your uh, case if you were bringing something up on the agenda in an elders meeting wasn't to refer to the bible but to bring with you a sheaf of notes from uh letters to elders from watchtower articles um from um the the body of elders uh uh, uh oh, they have a they have like a a, a large selection of l- letters that come from the society which are used for procedures and policies, anything like that. If you could quote the Watchtower, then you could make your case. If you just came with your Bible, people would shrug their shoulders and and think, well, so what? Um, my experience was it was all about the Watchtower, not nothing to do with uh, the the biblical truth. So we have a few minutes left here. Let me end kind of with this question and just exploring this a little bit with you. So you came out of the watchtower, you, you got yourself into a church and then recently you started a YouTube channel called truth for JWs (laughs) reaching out, (laughs) reaching out to Jehovah's witnesses, making phenomenal videos. If any, if anybody out there hasn't been to Matthew's channel yet, you definitely need to go check it out and, and watch the videos that he makes because they're really compelling and they're really well done and they're they're done with grace and love and humility. So I highly encourage you to go to Truth4, the number four, JW's, all one word, on YouTube and check out his videos. But what compelled you to make that channel and start reaching out to Jehovah's Witnesses? Right. Um, well, <sighs> I, I don't want to sound tacky, but, um, you know, it's about Jesus. I, I want people to be born of God. That's all. I just want people to know the truth. I don't want to slam the watchtower. I don't want to, you know, um, make people cry <laughs> thinking they've ruined their life. No, I, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that the truth is in him. And I believe that, um, that even to some degree churches get it wrong. They, they, I'm not talking about uh, necessarily evangelical, um, view, but, you know, say, say, for example, um, Church of England, which, you know, has a very bad reputation over here and it's, it's very religious and it's very liberal. Um, it's not about any of that. It's about coming to know Jesus Christ, um, and, and, and Jehovah, God. As your as your father, you know, one on one, that can be that can be yours if if you only seek him out and and pray. Um, you know what what you have is religion, and sadly you're trapped in dogma, and you need to get out of that. You know, Brian, I do believe in hell as well. Um, some people won't like that, but I. I do believe in it. I believe that there's a place, there are eternal consequences for bad decisions. So I want people to, um, to think strongly, um, and, and, and carefully about what, what they're doing with their life because, um, you know, the witnesses talk about the end of the world an awful lot, but they need to think about their own end, which everybody comes to in their lifetime, that, 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 that time when we, we die and, uh, that comes at any moment. 
and you know there are two futures there there's one eternal salvation and there's the other which is um a, a, an eternal hell and I, I don't want anybody to go there so you started making the videos out of compassion and so people could find hope, yes. hope sorry, in Jesus yes, Christ. Because, yeah, so yeah, people could exactly. find hope in Jesus Christ. I hear yes. that in what you're saying. I mean, you're bringing up hell and everything, but that's really what it is. If you believe that people are going to hell and you believe that that's what the yes. Bible preaches, who yes. could fault you? If, if you're being logically consistent, who could fault you for warning yes. somebody and in, in, in wanting people to come to know Jesus and experience him the way that, that you've experienced him? Yes, yes. I mean, the gospel is twofold, isn't it? It's certainly the love of God, the love of Christ. Um, but there's also judgment there as well. We have to be balanced about the gospel. Um, and too often we talk about, you know, it's all, we always go on about the love. But I want people to think also um, soberly about the consequences of their bad decisions of not um, seeking out Jesus Christ too. Uh, if you do, if they do get a chance of people, you know, people who are listening, Francis Chan has brought out a great book about this, um, about the subject of hell. Uh, if they get a chance, they might read it because it addresses a lot of the, the, um, the uh, criticisms made against the notion of, of hell. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it really sobers you up, that book. So uh, I would recommend anyone to look at that. That's the book that he wrote in response to Rob Bell, correct? Mm, yes, that's right. Yes, exactly right. Yes. So, yeah, I would I would suggest anybody look at that because it looks at all the Greek. And um, I mean, I'd, I'd read other books prior to that, which would convince me of of its uh, literality. But th this is a this is an excellent book I've just finished. And uh yeah, I, th I think it will just give people an idea of what the gospel is is about. It's not just about um, the love of God, but there's judgment as well. Now, how does your family react to what you're doing? Do they know? Well, I think they think I'm a nutcase, Brian. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've embraced everything that's uh, repugnant, isn't it, about the about Christendom, as they would say. Uh, you know, I, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, everything. I mean, they just think uh, I've lost it. Um, so unfortunately, um, I was giving out uh, in the streets some gospel tracts last year. And there had been a couple of uh, witnesses to this, Jehovah's Witnesses. And they reported me. Um, they'd made an investigation. They'd written to London Bethel and they decided to. Uh, disassociate me uh, they considered my actions to be that of somebody who was really disassociating themselves so i haven't really spoken to my family since uh well it'll be probably september last year so currently i am persona non grata <laughs> but there we are you're being shunned i'm being shunned yeah yes. the rotters <laughs> rotters <laughs> mm -hmm. but um you know people say Oh, it must, it must be awful. How are you coping? Um, you do make a terrific, it's Jesus is absolutely right, isn't he? <laughs> when he says about making lots of friends, lots of mothers, fathers and so on and uh, surrogate brothers and sisters through uh, your faith. Um, and we, when we're born of God, um, we're met, we have a moment there when we're complete, where we where we find the meaning of life and yes we go through trials but having jesus in us um knowing god um it, it's an incredible privilege experience and nothing holds a candle to it so you can you can you can overcome even those difficult times because you look to the cross of christ and his love more than makes up for your loss. Yeah, that's right. Jesus doesn't promise us our best life now, does he? We go through trials no. and we go through all mm -hmm. sorts of different things. If we're really living out our faith, I think we mm -hmm. all go through periods of struggle and trial. But what Jesus mm -hmm. does promise us is that he'll be with us in those trials and he'll be with us through those trials and he'll give us grace to get through them. And he'll, he'll never leave us alone. So 
Um, that's just such a great testimony for the Jehovah's Witnesses out there who are struggling, saying, oh, what am I going to do? You know, I, I feel Christ calling me and, and I want to accept Jesus, but I'm afraid of what's going to happen to, you know, with my family and yeah. those relationships. They're going to be broken and, and I'm going to suffer for it. And I, I love what you said about that, because I think that could probably bring a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses some comfort and some security, knowing that Jesus is enough and he's not going to leave you alone through it. No, that's right, Brian. Uh, it's, uh, you must not underestimate God because, uh, oh, w- w- when he fills you um, and we're commanded to keep getting filled with the spirit. Um, and that, that happens to me from time to time. You just remember how awesome God is. And how he fills your every need. He is the comforter. Amen. How, yeah. one last question before we go, because yeah. we're out of time here, but let me ask you this. How has the reaction been to your YouTube channel? I remember talking to you or messaging back and forth or some kind of communication we had about six months ago or so. Yeah. And you had said, I was surprised by the reaction that I got to the videos. Yes, I, I was, Brian. I, I really wasn't expecting uh, to get so many uh, people sending me emails. I mean, if a friend of mine has just started up a website for me, uh, Truth for JWs. It seems to have turned into a little bit like a kind of a ministry. I I, uh, I really did not expect it. I thought, <laughs> what happened is there was a guy on YouTube who expressed that he was depressed as a witness and I, I made a response video and um and then from there I thought oh, I'll make some more uh try and help people and now I'm I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm getting a lot of a lot of interest uh, I have my um email address there and I get several emails a day uh and I also conduct uh dialogues with a number of people uh who are witnesses um who are looking for the truth so it's it's been um, a real blessing. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a real blessing. Why don't you give us your information? Let me let me just ask you one by one. Your YouTube channel is. Yeah, so that's truth for JWs. So it, that that's truth. Then the number four, then JWS. It's all one word. Oh. So you can find me there. OK. And then your website is. So that is I've j- literally just got that um, set up. I, I need to get articles on it now <laughs> um which would be truth for truth for jws.com okay and then if anybody wants to contact you do you have an email address well yeah i mean if they go to truth for jws.com there's um there's a, a link there but it's inquiries at truth for jws.com okay yeah well, yeah. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the program today. I, I hope you'll be back because I know there's a lot more to your story and there's lots of other things that we could have talked about today. And yeah. so I so I do hope that you'll come back. And I just want to thank you for being on the show. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I Did I do OK? You did OK. <laughs> you did more than OK. Any last? I was very, I was very nervous. I, I'm not very good over the phone, or, you know, that kind of thing. It's not my thing, but uh, there we are. You, you did it. You did a great job. A- any last words you have for any struggling oh. Jehovah's Witnesses out there? Um, yeah. I, do you know what? I would say if they've got a kingdom in or, um, uh, you know, a reference Bible, go to John 14, 14, go to John 14, 14 and find out who you can pray to right now. Find out who, how, who you can pray to right now. Look at John 14, 14. Uh, in the reference Bible, it'll take you to a footnote. And you'll discover that if you ask Jesus anything, if you ask Jesus anything in his name, you know, he'll grant it. So uh, my answer is if you're struggling and you're really wanting the truth, go to Christ. He, he, he welcomes you and pray to him and he'll answer. That's my message. Amen. Thank you for that. And that's absolutely true. If you're looking for truth, you find it in the person of yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to thank everybody for listening today. I want to thank again Matthew for coming on the show. And that's it for this week. Until next time, thanks for listening. If you have comment or complaint, or if you would like to be a guest on this program, please contact Brian or Brock at watchtalkradio at gmail.com. That's watchtalkradio at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us today.